Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to another hour of mystery and suspense. To a terrifying battle of wits. Our play poses a dilemma you have never faced or are likely to face in your lifetime. Whether to commit the murder in your heart when your mind tells you to restrain yourself. Listen to what happened to one man, Thomas Drake, who did face that dilemma and what he did about it. Our mystery drama, Under Grave Suspicion, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Hank Warner and stars Ralph Bell. Have you ever returned home late one night and listened in the still darkness, tense and trembling, hoping and praying that you would not hear the whispered passions of your wife and a stranger, fearful that you could not, would not control a blinding fury to kill? That man getting out of the car on that dark dead-end road on the windswept bluff, overlooking the desolate Long Island Sound beach, hurrying by cloud-veiled moonlight down the winding footpath through the scrub pines and brush to his isolated cottage, is Thomas Drake. Despondent, depressed. I should have telephoned, given us some warning, that I'd be home a night earlier. But deep down, I had the feeling that I still couldn't trust her. And I had to find out... I hurried towards the cottage, wondering why there were no lights on, wondering whether she was asleep, alone, or with. I walked around from the back of the house, across the gravel mound, toward the waterside port steps, not caring whether the crunch of my footsteps could be heard inside. The only other sound was my pounding heart and the surf washing the loose gravel off the burn. The half-moon slipped behind a bank of black clouds. And in the darkness, I tripped over the shovel, left lying on the gravel. I kicked it away. I went up the port steps to the front door. I tried it. It was not locked. I stepped inside and listened. I called out, Marianne! The bedroom door was closed. I opened the door. I stabbed at the light wall switch. The ceiling flooded. Uh, an empty made up bed. I went to the kitchen. Turned on the light. It was swept and tidy. The counter, the sink, the stove top, bare and dry. Not a trace of food particles. No lingering cooking odors. The dish mop, dish towel, bone dry. I needed a drink to calm down. I reached for the bottle of bourbon in the kitchen cabinet. Poured myself a stiff one. Wondering where she was. The drink only added fuel to my slow burn. I flushed with waves of anger. I had to get out in the air to think. I put out the house lights, carry the bottle and the glass to the porch... And settle down to wait. The cool, onshore wind on my face. The moon playing hide and seek with the dark clouds. The lights of Connecticut blinking across ten miles of black water. The old field light alternating beams of green and red. It was restful. But as I nursed the bourbon, I couldn't altogether get her out of my mind. My thoughts wandering back in time. Wondering if she'd left me or would once again like the first time before we were married. And we're living together in my apartment on Manhattan's swinging east side. Two modern, sensible singles willing to give it a try. 
I had a job then. Good job. I was a vice president with electronics engineering. I got home that night. It was Friday night, about 8 o'clock. And as I let myself in... Yes. Yes, dear. I heard her talking on the phone. Come on up, Jack. Oh, ask the doorman to hold a cab. He just got home. Well, who was that, Jack Harrison? Of course. Who else? You know, I'm getting tired of his hanging around. Why don't you tell him to stop calling you? He didn't. I called him. You look so surprised, Thomas. You don't have the time anymore for anything but dear old electronics engineering. You did phone me you wouldn't be home for dinner, so I called him. There's a movie I wanted to see. That's the third time this week. Oh, I didn't know you were counting, darling. I waited that night, watching television, dozing fitfully. My mind going back to the smiles and looks they had exchanged as they left. I could see them after the movies going to the purple camellia, the nightcaps, and the wild rock of the panting cougars. And then senses stimulated bodies pulsating with savage beats to spend the night with him. I was awakened from my sleep in the chair by the buzzing TV set. It was four o'clock. I fought off the idea of phoning her at Harrison's apartment. I had no one but myself to blame. We had agreed, like two sensible moderns, that there'd be no strings, that we'd be free to live our own lives. And for the first time, I admitted to myself, I didn't want that freedom. By 10 o'clock that morning, I couldn't stand it. I phoned Harrison's apartment. There was no answer. I went down to the lobby reception desk to get the mail. It hadn't arrived yet. But the clerk handed me an unstamped envelope. My name and apartment number on it, in Marianne's handwriting. I tore it open. Dear Tom, I'm sorry. I think it would be best for both of us to call it quits. I'm going away. There was no date on the plain white note paper. No imprint of name and address, no forwarding address. Just signed, Marianne. I refused to believe it. I hurried right back up to the apartment to her bedroom closet. Her clothes were gone. I got through the day somehow, in a daze. But the next day, when I went out to get the Sunday paper and returned to the apartment... There she was, unpacking. I changed my mind. Let's have a drink. (laughs) Want to tell me? There's not much to tell. He told me he has a wife, three children in Connecticut, that she won't let him go, so he couldn't marry me. Marry you? You you want to get married? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Is that all? You wanted to get married? <laughs> Will you marry me? Yes. Now, here I am, waiting once again. Like two sensible moderns, we adjusted the marriage. We seemed to be making a go of it. Until I lost my job and the cutbacks of government contracts. We subleased the apartment, moved to the cottage to make the rounds of electronic firms on Long Island. I sat there on the porch, waiting once again, looking up and down the beach. And suddenly I saw a flashlight about a hundred yards down the beach. It moved around, but it did not advance. And then it went out. I listened. The crunch of footsteps on gravel, carried by the wind, grew louder. I could make out the silhouettes of a man and a fishing rod on his shoulder. He was alone, hugging the water line. And as he came abreast, I called out, uh, Any luck? 
It was Professor Mowry of the State University Marine Laboratory at nearby Flax Pond. Oh, not a thing. I was hoping to pick up a striper. Line got snarled in the reel too tangled to bother with tonight. Well, I'm just having a nightcap here. Did you join me, Professor? Hi. <laughs> yeah, I could stand one short one. I'm getting a bit nippy. We talked. He sipped his whiskey. I don't know how many I had. He talked about projects at the Marine Lab, the need for more state funds for research on wetlands, water pollution, erosion. He knew I was trying to get relocated, had given me a letter to an executive at the Grumman plant. Hear anything from Grumman? No, another thing. I've about exhausted the job possibilities on Long Island. I spent yesterday and today in New England. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for the drink. I'm sure the job market will open up. Uh, say hello to Mrs. Drake. Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Mallory. Yes? Would you do me a favor? Favor? Well, you're a friend of Emery, Richard Emery. I know you know him. But are you a friend of his? Well, he's one of several new young chaps doing postdoctorate work at the Marine Lab. It's a small group, and we're all more or less friendly. I mean... Will he listen to you as a friend? Listen? Yes. Tell him to stay away from my wife. Well, Emery? Your wife? That's right. Don't ask me how I know. Little things, I know. I I come home tonight. She's not home. I know. Well, it's a rather personal matter. I don't feel I have the right to meddle in the personal affairs of a faculty member. If he doesn't, I'll kill him. Now, Drake, don't talk like that. Sensible people don't solve such problems like that. That's but... what I always thought, but now I... Look, Drake, if you don't mind my giving you some advice, why don't you just get a divorce or a separation? You just tell Emery to stay away from her. You must tell her, Mallory. You must. I don't want to kill him, but I'm afraid. There'll be a breaking point. You tell him, Mallory, tell him. If you don't, you'll share the responsibility. Now, Tom, Tom, you're overwrought. You'll feel better in the morning. All right, I'll, I'll talk to Emery. Thanks. Good night, Tom. It still had about one drink in it. I walked down to the water line. I swallowed what was left in the bottle. And with swelling anger, I flung it into the waves. I turned back towards the cottage and stopped. I saw a flashlight down the beach. I could make out two persons walking toward me. And then the light was out silhouetted against the night sky. Two forms embraced as one. And then carried by the wind rising out of the northeast, I heard the teasing laughter of Marianne. Well, there may be laughter in the wind, but for poor Tom, this is no time for levity. Wonder whether he knows that it's an ill wind and will blow him no good. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Now, what's a fella to do? Poor Tom Drake is in the dark and all at sea, wondering where he ought to be or not to be. But let's not blow the man down. Just lend me your ears and we'll listen. Their embrace in the dark was brief. And they started walking towards the cottage without using the flashlight. For a split second, I thought of walking towards them for a showdown. But Mallory's promise to talk to Emery made me put aside the impulse. I ducked behind a line of boulders that formed a breakwater above a high water line. They stopped in front of the cottage. From behind the boulders, I watched 
and listened. Oh, that was a good hike. Yeah. Let's go inside. Oh, let's sit out here for a while. It's such a beautiful night. I'd like a cigarette. Okay. He sat down beside her, struck a match, cupped it in his hands and held it to the cigarette in her lips. In the glow from the match flame, her face flushed, her eyes dreamy with desire. I knew I would never give her up. I'm going out to Montauk next week. It's a long Monday holiday weekend. How about coming with me? Mm, I'd love to, but I'll have to figure out some excuse to be away. Figure out? <laughs> well, that shouldn't be any problem. You're pretty clever about such things. I'll think of something. I couldn't help thinking she was pretty clever about such things. Like the night she went to that very clever Harrison leading her on. I'd never forget that Friday night. And now, another Friday night. Come on, let's go inside. You said he won't be back tonight. Oh, relax, Richard. You mean to tell me you prefer this cold gravel to a nice comfortable couch. Come on, Marianne. Oh, what's wrong with staying out here? Oh, Mark, I am was content with a, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread beneath a bow. Oh, not bad. <laughs> not bad. <laughs> the laughter broke off suddenly. I saw the glowing tips of two flipped cigarettes. And then... Oh, kiss me, Richard. Oh, I'm crazy about you. <laughs> Stop it! Stop it! Tom! What are you... Marianne, go inside. Go inside, I tell you. Now, wait a minute. Why? If you have anything to say, you can say it here in front of Richard. Go inside. Let go of my arm. Now, listen, you leave her alone. Let go of her. He broke my grip on her arm and pushed me away. The shove made me slip to my knees. I came up swinging at his face. I missed. He pinned my arms from behind. Now, listen. What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? I broke out of his grip, stepped back from him, and fell across the shovel. I grabbed the handle, jumped up. No, no! And swung at Emery. I... Too late for me to stop the swing. No! As she rushed in between us, the sharp edge of the shovel hit her in the back of her head. Oh! Oh, my God! I stood there, holding the shovel, unable to move, my eyes fixed on her face as Emery knelt down over her with a flashlight. I watched her face and prayed, prayed she wouldn't die. I trembled with fear and anguish, telling myself this couldn't be. It was a nightmare. Emery turned the flashlight on me, studied my trembling lips, my glazed eyes fixed on Marianne. She's... she's dead. I heard him, but didn't answer. I couldn't take my eyes off her. Drake... Did you hear what I said? She's dead. You killed her. You better go in the house and call the police. I looked at him, puzzled. My mind, my eyes, my memory playing tricks on me, wondering who he was. Harrison? Jack Harrison? Mocking me the night he took her to the movie, telling me... We'll be back. What's the matter with you, Drake? Don't you hear me? Call the police. I'll, I'll tell them. I'll, I'll, I'll say it was an accident. She tried to think. I don't think you've heard a word I said. I'll call the police myself. Where are you going, Harrison? Call the... Who's Harrison? I'm Emery. Richard Emery. Drake. I'll be right back. Don't turn your back on me. What? He looked back as I swung the shovel. His mouth open, his eyes unbelieving. He went down. I hit him again. He was still, lying on his face. I staggered, gasping for air. My head pounding, thousands of pinpoints of light exploding inside my head. I sank down on the steps of the porch, holding my head in my hands, trying to clear my head. Groping to recall, understand what had happened to me, to them. Slowly, the horror of it all returned. Marianne was dead. I turned the other body face up. 
It was not Harrison. It was Emery. I don't know how long I sat there on the porch steps. Finally, I faced it. I decided to try to get rid of the bodies. Bury them temporarily in the gravel berm. I'd have to get a small boat. That rowboat. In the woods, just above the flood water line, stored by one of these summer residents. I'd row the bodies out to the channel, weight them, drop them overboard on an outgoing tide. The strong current on the bottom of the channel would move them out to the sea. The loose gravel was only about three feet deep. It would be deep enough to hide them. I dragged the bodies over, laid them end to end, covered them, building up the gravel mound to the same height of the burn that ran parallel to the water level. I inspected the shovel. The metal glistened clean, no sign of blood or hair. I stood it against the porch rail, went inside. I sprawled out on the bed, exhausted, and fell into a heavy, dreamless sleep. I woke up the next morning about an hour after sunrise. My mind clear, instantly aware of what had happened, what I had done. I jumped off the bed, went to the porch door, looked at the gravel graves on the burn. It looked natural, peaceful, like a cemetery. I knew what I had to do. I put on the coffee, showered, changed my clothes. Became aware that her clothes were still hanging in the closet. I got the old note she had left me on that weekend with Harrison. Read it over and over as I had my coffee on the kitchen counter. I turned on the radio for the weather. The Bureau reports Hurricane Gilda moving past Cape Hatteras. Leaving a devastating I placed the note on the counter, the carefully spilled a spoonful of coffee on the counter, wetting a large Earth corner of the paper, and then blotted it with a paper towel. I knew I'd have to keep checking the weather, but first, get rid of her clothes. I put them in a large plastic garbage bag. I knew I'd have to stay close to the cottage until I got rid of the bodies, lay in a supply of food, so I drove to the supermarket put the clothes into the collection bin of the Salvation Army on the parking lot. I did my shopping and was back in less than an hour. I went up to where the rowboat was on the bank of trees. It looked all right. Aluminum, light enough to drag. The oars were in it and burlap fish bags, strong enough to hold the rocks I'd use for weights. I'd have to wait until dark to move the bodies. In the meantime, I could move the boat. It was a couple of hundred yards. I placed the boat on top of the grave. By nightfall, the Coast Guard was sending out small craft warnings, and all through the night, I was glued to the radio for weather checks, feeling trapped, helpless to do what I had planned. I finally fell asleep on the couch. I was awakened by the Sunday morning church music and a loud knocking on the porch door. Hey, you in now? I didn't recognize the voice, and I hesitated. The knocking stopped. I heard him walk down the porch steps. I put on my shoes, went to the door. He was sitting on the edge of the transom of the boat, his back to me, smoking a cigarette, fishing pole across his knees. It was Mallory. He turned. Didn't wake you, did I? I heard the radio. I thought I'd stop by. Uh, you all right? Okay now, but uh, yesterday, <laughs> what a head. All day. <laughs> How about some coffee? Oh, thanks for that. Got to get back to the lab. I didn't know you had a boat. Well, oh, it's not mine. Belongs to the Johnsons. I uh, saw a couple of kids dragging it out of the, the, the uh, patch of trees up there. They... Ran when I started towards them. Thought I'd better keep it here for them. Ah, I guess it's safe enough here. Unless we get that hurricane. I'd pull it up on higher ground if the weather gets worse and 
Gilder doesn't move out to sea. Well, I'm glad to see you feeling better. Uh, Dr. Mowry, did, uh, did you get a chance to talk to Emery? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, I haven't seen him. I stopped by his room Friday night after I left you. He wasn't in. I left a note to call me. I didn't hear from him all day Saturday. He wasn't in Saturday night. Not in his room this morning, either. It's not like him to go off without a word. Hmm. I've been uh, thinking over, Dr. Mowry. It's, uh, it's no use talking to Emory. I can't keep it tied to me. She's left me. Oh, did she? I'm sorry. Eh, perhaps for the best. Well, she didn't get home Friday night and left me a note. I found it in the kitchen Saturday morning. Is she leaving you for Emory? She didn't say. Ah, I see. Uh-huh. Well, I'm sorry, Drake. I really am. Sunday night, I was still trapped by the weather. It got worse through the night. But the weather report said that there still was a 50-50 chance that the hurricane would bypass Long Island. About noon the next day, the wind died down. I stood there by the rowboat, wondering whether I should take the chance in broad daylight. Long Island Sound was still calm as a lake. I heard a helicopter coming across Crane Neck. Routine patrol of the shore. I could read Suffolk Police. And then Dr. Mowry coming down the beach towards me. I stood there waiting for him. I'm um, glad I found you home, Drake. Uh, Oh, I've just uh, been answering more job ads. Yeah, have you heard from Mrs. Drake? A letter, perhaps a phone call? uh... Why, no, I, I haven't. Well, I'm getting really concerned about Emery. No one at the lab has seen him or heard from him for three days. Uh, this morning, I I looked through his room. His clothes, his suitcases were there. But I can't understand. I, uh, I, I was hoping if you'd heard from Mrs. Drake and knew where she was, I'd ask her if she had any idea about where Emery might be. Well, I do have her mother's phone number in Ohio and uh, her sister's in Connecticut. If you don't mind. Do you want to call from here? Uh, thanks, but I'm on my way to the village hall to see Police Chief Raymond. I stood there watching him make his way along the beach to the village hall at the old field lighthouse, wondering just what he'd tell Chief Raymond. Well, you know what they say. The past of gory murder leads but to the grave. What do you suppose will happen to Tom Drake? Will he be like that comedian who murdered people with stolen jokes and was hanged by his wit's end? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. The lot of most policemen is not a happy one. Wonder how Police Chief Raymond will receive Professor Mallory. Will he use the right bait and make a haul? Or lose hook, line, and sinker? Let's follow our troubled professor and find out. What's this all about? Emma said to tell me it was urgent. Well, I mean, it's not a matter of life or death, is it? I hope not. Ooh, well. You sound like you're not so sure. I'm not, but I am getting worried. Somebody been uh, stealing typewriters and lab equipment again? No, 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 Chief. I... Well, this may sound odd, but... A member of the lab faculty is, uh, seems to be missing. Oh? That's so. What do you mean, missing? No one's seen him since Friday afternoon. Well, this is only Monday. Yes, yes, but... He was not in his room Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. He didn't show up in the lab today. Well, what about his weekends? Did he have them free? Oh, sometimes, when scheduled. He was not scheduled to be off this weekend. Uh Uh-huh. 
The chap he rooms with, Garrison, says he saw Emery Friday noon. Well, Garrison was off this past weekend. He got back Sunday night. I saw Garrison this morning. He wasn't surprised or upset over the fact that Emery hadn't spent the night in his room. Mm-hmm. It uh, wasn't the first time. Do you know that cottage the Drakes rented? Yes, I do. It belongs to Howard. Is that, is that the one? What about it? Well, last Friday night, I was out casting along the beach. On my way back to the lab, Drake invited me to stop for a nightcap on the porch. He'd already had quite a few. And I had one drink with him, and he asked me, was I a friend of Emery's? And he asked me, the way he put it, would I do him a favor? Mm-hmm. Go on, go on. What he wanted me to do was for me to tell Emery to stay away from his wife. Uh, <clears throat> now, did he explain that? Did he mean Emery was annoying his wife, or did he mean they were having an affair? Well, my first impression was that it was more or less a dalliance. <laughs> well, that's kind of par for the course in this university town, you know. Yes, perhaps, but I... I told him I'd prefer not to get involved in personal affairs of faculty members. And what did he say? He said if Emery didn't stay away, he'd kill him. His exact words. Of course, he was very drunk when he said it. I told Drake to calm him down that I'd talk to Emery. Yes, I see. Well, now, what about Mrs. Drake? Was there anything said to indicate whether she was inside the cottage while Drake was blowing his top this way to you? No, no. There were no lights on inside. Matter of fact, Drake made it clear that she was not home. He implied, without mentioning Emery by name, that she was out somewhere with him. Well, in that case, she could have some idea about where he might be. Hmm? Uh, that occurred to me. I I went back there yesterday morning with that in mind. And did she? She wasn't there. Drake told me she'd left him. He said she didn't come home at all Friday night. He said he found a note from her in the kitchen Saturday morning. Well, that's quite a coincidence, to say the least. Did the note say she'd uh, gone away with Emery? Well, Drake didn't show me the note, but as much as said, there was no mention of Emery. Have you been to the cottage since yesterday? I stopped there on my way here. Drake says he hasn't heard a word from her. No mail, no phone call. But I asked him, would she perhaps have gone to her parents' home, to a relative? He gave me... These phone numbers. Oh, yes. Let me see that. Ohio and Connecticut. You think we ought to call them? No. No. I'll drop in on Drake. I'd rather he made the call. You see, if we can't locate Mrs. Drake and you don't hear from Emory, that leaves us with two missing persons. We'll put out an all-points teletype alarm, full descriptions, and photos. I'll keep you posted, Mallory. <laughs> Come to the point, Drake. Mallory, Professor Mallory up at the Marine Lab, you know, came to see me. And he's a bit worried about the absence of a faculty member, one Richard Emery. There's no use being delicate about this, Drake. From what he told me, it does look like Emery and your wife ran off together, doesn't it? Yes, uh, it sure looks like it. Uh, do you mind if I see that note she left you? Oh, no, not at all. It's on the kitchen counter where I found it. We went into the kitchen. He picked up the note, studied it carefully, looked at the back of the paper, felt the coffee stain. Ah, uh, when did you, uh, discover this note? Uh, Saturday morning. Well, that stain, some coffee spilled from my cup as I was reading it. Oh, I see, I see. You, you mind if I, uh, look around? Oh, go right ahead. I followed him into the bedroom. He looked through her dresser, the closet the night table. Well, her clothes are gone, all right. I was looking for a letter she might have received from a friend or relative, you know, inviting her for a visit for a few days or a week. I mean, uh, did she mention such an invitation to you? No. Well, if she did get such a letter, she could have taken it with her. I mean, have you called her parents or her sister? Well, frankly, no. Uh, 
I was hoping I wouldn't have to do that, that uh, when she'd come back uh, or write a phone. Or... Well, if they don't turn up in a week or two, we might perhaps go on the assumption that they're dead. You see? And start a search for their bodies. D- d- <laughs> oh, I, I, you, you don't think... Uh... Well, look, Chief, I was drunk when I... I oh, told no, Mallory... no, 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 no. I don't think you killed them. Of course not. What would you do with the bodies? Uh, bury them out there? Let's not get morbid about this. You don't think I'm going to call out the tractors to scrape down the gravel, do you? Oh, by the way, how long are you planning to stay on here? A couple of weeks. All right, fine. Well, now, keep in touch. I'll call you if anything develops. Phone me if you get a letter or a call from your wife. I followed him out. He looked at the rowboat. Studied the sky. You know, I'd pull that little boat up higher beyond that low ground back of the house. I wouldn't be surprised if we get some of Hurricane Gilda before night's over. Better keep the radio set on the Coast Guard reports. I watched him go down the footpath across the low ground behind the cottage and then uphill to where his car was parked, top of the bluff. It was not till he was out of sight that I stopped sweating. It stayed calm, windless, an oppressive silence hanging over the water and the land. The sky was sunless, gray, not a cloud in sight. I'd heard of the calm before the storm, but I'd never seen it. I filled the kerosene lanterns, got candles ready. Gale warning, Cape May to Block Island. High tide three to four feet above normal with flooding along lowland. By late afternoon, brought up and down the sound, white caps galloped shoreward from as far as the eye could see. Treetops swayed and twisted in the whistling wind. The waves crashed higher on the shore. It started to rain hard. Windswept sheets of water lashed the roof and shingled side. The lights went off. I lit the lanterns and candles. Wind 50 to 60 knots. Residents alerted to evacuate low-lying shore areas. The door banged open, and the wind picked up the rowboat. Sent it rolling side over side across the low ground behind the house. I stood with a lantern on the gravel burn, watching the waves inching closer, lapping the foot of the gravel mound, loosening gravel in the backwash. And then I heard the phone ringing. I went to it, picked it up, still watching through the open door, the waves breaking over the gravel. Uh, hello? Hello, hello, Frank. This is Police Chief Raymond. What the hell are you still doing out there? Didn't you hear the evacuation alert? Oh, the... The, the, the phone fell out of my hand. I saw waves crashing over the grave and ran out. Drake, you listen to me carefully. There's been a breach in the shore about a quarter mile down the beach. Get the hell out of there. You'll be cut off. You hear me? Be there. Hello? Hello? had to keep shoveling on the gravel and sand as fast as the waves washed it off. But for every shovelful I threw in the grave, the waves washed off too. I lost track of time. I knew I had to keep at it to keep the grave covered. Heading close to the house, Mallory. Yeah. Great! Great! Dr. Henderson, 
of the police lab gave me an envelope to get to you. He said you wanted an analysis report in a hurry. That's right. What's it say? Read it to me. It says, The coffee stain is less than a week old. The ink is at least a year old. Uh, well, thanks, Mallory. By the way, do me a favor, will you? Leave a note to Highway Superintendent Murphy in the state office building. And tell him I said, uh, I won't be needing those tractors. Well, imagine. What do you think of that police chief? Isn't he the fishy character? Anyhow, we didn't have to scrape bottom. I'll be back shortly. And now, with another story of mystery and intrigue, here is Commander Neville Putney to keep you in... Anxiety. What's this story about, Commander? Well, it concerns a middle-aged business executive named Fremont Witherton, who, after spending his entire career with the same firm, returned home one evening with his dreams suddenly shattered. Is that you, Fremont? It's me, Erica. Fremont, you look so peaked. Erica, I've been fired. That new plant manager, he's been trying to cut me out, and today he succeeded. Well, you don't need to give me that hangdog look. Just go out and get another job. I'm through, Eric. I'm 58 years old. Nobody will hire me for half the salary I've been making. My only hope is to kill the plant manager. Fremont, I hate rough stuff, but if you've decided, your Ross goes upstairs in the trunk. You load it, and I'll warm up the getaway car. <laughs> Hey, young man, how about that for a story? Well, that was a dilly, Commander, but you just can't leave us this way. How did it all come out? Time's up for now, but tune in, Bob and Ray, on WOR 315 to 7, and maybe you'll find out. Still in a dilemma? We hope you never have to face it. We can offer some advice, though. When you are uptight about any matter, nothing like settling down at your radio and letting the cares of the day slip away as your mind and ears carry you off on a relaxing journey of mystery adventure. Our cast included Ralph Bell, Patricia Wheel, Robert Dryden, and William Redfield. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.